live stream. All right. If you're watching us from the live stream, you're welcome to today's discussion. All right. This is still Club One discussion class. Um, we are still in a uh, cranial nervous system, questions and answers. Now, the first question is about a 44-year-old woman with memory loss, poor concentration, and inability to recognize household projects or rather household objects, all right? She has right-handed involuntary written movement, and there's a strong family history of similar complaints. What is the single most likely diagnosis? Option A is um, Pick's dementia. Option B is Wilson's disease. Option C is Huntington's disease. Um, option D is HIV-associated dementia. Then option E is frontotemporal dementia. So Shara, what do you think? Okay, Sarah thinks we are dealing with a uh, hot intense, okay? Just like Dr. Suchi is also agreeing with hot intense. So let me see. Yes, it is hot intense disease. The, the basic thing that suggested it's fine. There's memory loss, there's poor concentration in other types of dementia, all right? And even sometimes in ability to recognize faces and other things that comes with memory loss, long-term and short-term memory loss. But what gives it away, one, is the involuntary written movement, okay? And then two, is a strong family history, strong family history of similar complaints, classical for Huntington's disease, right? So in Huntington's disease, a person with Huntington's disease may appear to have a lack of drive, initiative and concentration, involuntary jacking of or written movements, is also known as chorea. The typical presentation is between 35 to 55 years old. And our patient is uh, how many years old? Remember, we mentioned yesterday that our patient is 44 years old. And is a woman. So the age range is 35 to 55. That's like middle age, right? That's the middle age, right? So mentioned yesterday that. Um, normal Alzheimer's dementia has a predilection for very, very elderly people, okay? So, for you see Alzheimer's uh, disease, you know that this person has to be elderly, okay? So, um, let's see how we can make this screen share. Possible right now. Please hold on, Dr. Chara. Don't leave the class. challenge is sharing my screen okay so i'll just continue right while um, i think it's network okay 
but let me give you a short lecture on how things this. Welcome back, Dr. Suchi. So you see this, right? So we'll be seeing the how it works. Learning the medicine onset, is hard work. Osmosis diagnosis. makes it easy. It takes your lectures Business. and notes to create a personalized right. study plan with exclusive videos, practice questions, and flashcards, and so much more. Try it free today. Hunting yes, some people are very, HD very much excited. Learning medicine is hard work. Osmosis makes it easy. It takes your lectures and notes to create a personalized study plan with exclusive videos, practice questions, and flashcards, and so much more. A study plan with exclusive videos, practice questions, and flashcards, and so much more. Try it free today. Huntington disease, or HD, is a rare neurodegenerative disease that involves a repeated sequence of DNA that causes an abnormal protein to form leading to abnormal movements and cognitive problems. Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder, leading to abnormal movements and cognitive problems. Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder, which means that one affected copy of the gene is enough to cause disease. Affected people are typically present in each generation, because an affected person, male or female, has a 50% chance of passing on the affected gene to a child which causes that child to have the disease. In most people, a gene called Huntington or HTT on chromosome 4 contains a triplet repeat, where nucleotides C, A, and G are repeated 10 to 35 times in a row. In people with Huntington, male or female, has a 50% chance of passing on the affected gene to a child, which causes that child to have the disease. In most people, a gene called Huntington or HTT on chromosome 4 contains a triplet repeat, where nucleotides C, A, and G are repeated 10 to 35 times in a row. In people with Huntington disease, this disease. In most people, a gene called Huntington or HTT on chromosome 4 contains a triplet repeat, where nucleotides C, A, and G are repeated 10 to 35 times in a row. In people with Huntington disease, this repeat goes on for 36 or more times in a row. CAG codes for the amino acid glutamine, so people with Huntington disease will have 36 or more glutamines in a row in the Huntington protein. So in addition to being a triplet repeat disorder, HD is, more specifically, a polyglutamine disease. The specific way in which extra glutamines causes HD symptoms isn't fully worked out. But some clues are that the mutated protein aggregates within the neuronal cells of the caudate and the putamen of the basal ganglia, causing neuronal cell death. Cell death might be related to excitotoxicity, which is excessive signaling of these neurons, which leads to high intracellular calcium. The expanded CAG repeats not only affect the Huntington protein, they also affect disorder. HD is, more specifically, a polyglutamine disease. The specific way in which extra glutamines causes HD symptoms isn't fully worked out, but some clues are that the mutated protein aggregates within the neuronal cells of the caudate and the putamen of the basal ganglia, causing neuronal cell death. Cell death might be related to excitotoxicity, which is excessive signaling of these neurons, which leads to high intracellular calcium. The expanded CAG repeats not on race can basically lose track of which CAG it's on, and accidentally add extra CAGs. Since as a zygote develops into a fetus and eventually into a full adult, by the time sperm and eggs are created, several dozen cell divisions, each with a round of DNA replication, have taken place. 
and so there have been a lot of opportunities for repeat expansion. And the more repeats that are added, the more unstable it gets. This expansion of the originally inherited gene means that a child of a parent with HD can inherit even more CAG repeats than the parent did. The higher the number of repeats in the protein, the earlier the age when a person starts having symptoms. And this phenomenon is called anticipation, which means that the Huntington disease families often show earlier symptom onset with each generation. Even repeats of 27 to 35 CAGs can expand occasionally, and these are called pre-mutation alleles, since they don't cause the disease, but they're set up for developing a mutation of 36 or more CAGs. Like we've mentioned, this process of adding more repeats is called repeat expansion, and it happens way more in the production of sperm than of eggs. So both anticipation and new disease alleles generally happens when the father's the affected parent. When a person has 40 plus repeats, they show 100% penetrance, and they will have the disease. For reasons that remain unknown, people with 36 to 39 repeats can show reduced penetrance. And these are called and This process of adding more repeats is called repeat expansion. And it happens way more in the production of sperm than of eggs. So both anticipation and new the symptoms of Huntington disease involve progressive central nervous system disturbances, including movement, cognitive, and mood symptoms. The average age of onset is around 40 years old, although remember that the age of onset depends on the number of CAG repeats. Mood years old, although remember that the age of onset depends on the number of CAG repeats together form the dorsal striatum, then it can cause actual loss of brain tissue volume in that area and expansion of the lateral ventricles. These areas play an important role in movement, particularly inhibiting it. And that's why neuronal death in the basal ganglia causes movement problems like chorea, which are purposeless, dance-like jerky movements, and athetosis, which are slower, writhing, snake-like movements, mainly affecting the hands. These involuntary movements can't be consciously suppressed and stop only with sleep. Other motor problems... You can't hear. Dr. Noya, can you hear? Dr. Sochi, can you hear? Dr. Sochi can hear. Chara, it's from your head, from your end. All right. Just maybe log out and log in again. Or try increasing your volume. Make sure your volume is not low. Problems include abnormal eye movements and poor coordination. Loss of tissue in these regions can also lead to psychological problems as well, like dementia, personality changes, and depression. Even though this might be oversimplifying things a bit, the brain regions affected by Huntington disease have decreased GABA and acetylcholine, and increased dopamine levels. This increased dopamine helps explain why neuroleptics, which are dopamine receptor antagonists, and tetrabenazine, which depletes dopamine, are used to treat chorea in people with Huntington disease. Unfortunately, these and other pharmacologic treatments don't affect overall survival, and death usually happens within 10 to 20 years of diagnosis, often by aspiration pneumonia on account of discoordinated swallowing or suicide. There are actually several dozen other triplet repeat disorders in addition to Huntington disease, some of which also have CAG as the repeated nucleotides, but in a different gene. Others of which, though, have different repeats, like myotonic dystrophy, which is a CTG repeat, Friedrich ataxia, a GAA repeat, and fragile X syndrome, a CGG repeat. All right, so as a quick recap. Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant disease caused by having 36 or more trinucleotide repeats of CAG in the Huntington gene, which causes neuronal cell death in the basal ganglia, causing movement symptoms like chorea and athetosis, as well as mental symptoms like depression and dementia. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, Take a look at osmosis.org, where we have flashcards, questions, and other awesome tools to help you learn medicine. Otherwise, you can always support us by donating on Patreon, subscribing to our channel, or following us on social media.
Learning medicine is hard work. Osmosis makes it easy. It takes your lectures and notes to create a personalized study plan with exclusive videos, practice questions, and flashcards, and so much more. Try it free today. Huntington disease, or HD, is a rare neurodegenerative disease that involves a repeated sequence of DNA that causes an abnormal protein to form, leading to abnormal movements and cognitive problems. Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder, which means that one affected copy of the gene is enough to cause disease. Affected people are typically present in each generation because an affected person, male or female, has a 50% chance of passing on the affected gene to a child, which causes that child to have the disease. In most people, a gene called Huntington or HTT on chromosome 4 contains a triplet repeat, where nucleotides C, A, and G are repeated 10 to 35 times in a row. In people with Huntington disease, this repeat goes on for 36 or more times in a row. CAG codes for the amino acid glutamine, so people with Huntington disease will have 36 or more glutamines in a row in the Huntington protein. So in addition to being a triplet repeat disorder, HD is, more specifically, a polyglutamine disease. The specific way in which extra glutamines causes HD symptoms isn't fully worked out. But some clues are that the mutated protein aggregates within the neuronal cells of the caudate and the putamen of the basal ganglia, causing neuronal cell death. Cell death might be related to excitotoxicity, which is excessive signaling of these neurons, which leads to high intracellular calcium. The expanded CAG repeats not only affect the Huntington protein, they also affect DNA replication itself. When copying the HTT gene, DNA polymerase can basically lose track of which CAG it's on, and accidentally add extra CAGs. Since as a zygote develops into a fetus, and eventually into a full adult, by the time sperm and eggs are created, several dozen cell divisions, each with a round of DNA replication, have taken place. And so there have been a lot of opportunities for repeat expansion. And the more repeats that are added, the more unstable it gets. This expansion of the originally inherited gene means that a child of a parent with HD can inherit even more CAG repeats than the parent did. The higher the number of repeats in the protein, the earlier the age when a person starts having symptoms. And this phenomenon is called anticipation, which means that the Huntington disease families often show earlier symptom onset with each generation. Even repeats of 27 to 35 CAGs can expand occasionally, and these are called pre-mutation alleles, since they don't cause the disease, but they're set up for developing a mutation of 36 or more CAGs. Like we've mentioned, this process of adding more repeats is called repeat expansion, and it happens way more in the production of sperm than of eggs. So both anticipation and new disease alleles generally happens when the father's the affected parent. When a person has 40 plus repeats, they show 100% penetrance, and they will have the disease. For reasons that remain unknown, people with 36 to 39 repeats can show reduced penetrance. Some may have symptoms while others may not. Because of this penetrance, the test for HD, which counts the number of CAG repeats, is really good at determining whether Huntington disease will develop in an at-risk individual. Now, The symptoms of Huntington disease involve progressive central nervous system disturbances, including movement, cognitive, and mood symptoms. The average age of onset is around 40 years old, although remember that the age of onset depends on the number of CAG repeats. Over time, if enough of the neurons die in the caudate and putamen, which together form the dorsal striatum, then it can cause actual loss of brain tissue volume in that area and expansion of the lateral ventricles. These areas play an important role in movement, particularly inhibiting it. And that's why neuronal death in the basal ganglia causes movement problems like chorea, which are purposeless, dance-like jerky movements, and athetosis, which are slower, writhing, snake-like movements, mainly affecting the hands. These involuntary movements can't be consciously suppressed and stop only with sleep. Other motor problems include abnormal eye movements and poor coordination. Loss of tissue in these regions can also lead to psychological problems as well like dementia, personality changes, and depression. Even though this might be oversimplifying things a bit, 
The brain regions affected by Huntington disease have decreased GABA and acetylcholine, and increased dopamine levels. This increased dopamine helps explain why neuroleptics, which are dopamine receptor antagonists, and tetrabenazine, which depletes dopamine, are used to treat chorea in people with Huntington disease. Unfortunately, these and other pharmacologic treatments don't affect overall survival, and death usually happens within 10 to 20 years of diagnosis, often by aspiration pneumonia on account of discoordinated swallowing or suicide. There are actually several dozen other triplet repeat disorders in addition to Huntington disease, some of which also have CAG as the repeated nucleotides, but in a different gene. Others of which, though, have different repeats, like myotonic dystrophy, which is a CTG repeat, Friedrich ataxia, a GAA repeat, and fragile X syndrome, a CGG repeat. All right, so as a quick recap. Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant disease caused by having 36 or more trinucleotide repeats of CAG in the Huntington gene, which causes neuronal cell death in the basal ganglia, causing movement symptoms like chorea and athetosis, as well as mental symptoms like depression and dementia. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, Wow, guys, did you see that? What struck me was when he talked about the, the, the causes of death and they mentioned that this person is going to die within 10 to 20 years from diagnosis and that also this person is going to die from suicide. My God, it's so, so touching. And the fact that once a family member has it, is autosomal dominant inheritance. The child will have it. And that it's um, the, the triplets, whatever multiplication gets, you know, increasing. It, it, it increases with each generation, all right? So let's say if the father has a 32 triplet uh, repeats, then this, the, the child may have 30 something, you know? And down, down, down the generation, it gets worse. So it's a very, 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 very painful disease. And that has, you know, it determines. So it's very sad. I believe we've taken something away from Huntington's disease. For those who, the question that led to us discussing Huntington's disease was about a 44-year-old woman with memory loss, poor concentration, and inability to recognize household projects, objects, right? She has right-handed involuntary written movement, and there's a strong family history of similar complaints. What's the single most likely diagnosis? And the answer was Huntington's disease among peaks, dementia, Wilson's disease, HIV-associated dementia, frontotemporal dementia. Right, so um, what's the disease stood out? Right, what's going to Wilson's disease again? Let me see those who are reading or those who went through our stuff or primaries. Wilson's disease, what's Wilson's disease, and what causes it? Wilson's disease is also known as hepatolenticular degeneration, yes, and it's caused by excessive copper accumulation in tissues, including the brain, the liver, all right, and some other tissues, okay? So, you are correct. So, the next question is about, um, since I'm having challenges um, sharing my screen, I'll have to be posting it in the in the group. Next question is about a 74 year old man who has been admitted unconscious with no history. He has a GCS of six and a dilated left pupil, which becomes insensitive to light. What's the single most likely diagnosis?
24 year old man has been admitted unconscious, right? With no history, no history, right? He just came in unconscious. GCS is six over 15, and he has a dilated left pupil, which becomes insensitive to light, all right? What is the single most likely diagnosis? Think, think, think. What do you think is going on? The pointers, one, age. Age is a pointer. Two, level of consciousness. Three, dilated left pupil, which is said to be insensitive to light. There is a unilateral uh, a pupillary or reactive pupil. Unilateral. What does it suggest? Dr. Sochi thinks it's subarachnoid hemorrhage. Dr. Chara, what do you think? Dr. Noya, Dr. Bishop, what do you think? Yeah, no, attempts, attempts, attempts. Everybody is saying subarachnoid hemorrhage. Can you people defend that answer? On what basis? On what basis are you in subarachnoid hemorrhage? I'm awaiting your explanations. Since it's only one pupil, it can be opioid. <laughs> okay. You're trying. You are really now opioid. So is you're thinking is. What of meningitis? Okay, uh, let me categorically tell you that it, it, it is not a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, it is not unlikely to be subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, guys, um, I'm back. So you are thinking if it's epidural hematoma, you have history of trauma. Didn't you listen to what they said? It's just, it's, it's just, this case is as if they just found a man, all right, on the road. He's unconscious. You have no idea. Have a, okay, you guys are not working. I don't know where you are working anyway. But there have been cases where they brought the patient, you know, the name, the chest name is unknown, unknown. That's the name on the case notes, unknown, unknown. Do you understand? So nobody knows this patient. Maybe a Samaritan saw him on the road. So you as a doctor will now, there's no history. You as a doctor will now be the one to figure out the history, figure out the diagnosis, figure out everything. All right? Maybe later you will now start getting history. Maybe later a family member will now find the, find the patient to the hospital and now uh, you will now get history. But at that point, all you are working with is your clinical acumen, all right? It is, it is extradural hematoma. Maybe, it may be, all right? But though they didn't give us any history concerning that, it may be. 
concerning when when you see when you see when you see um a patient that has a nice a, a nice to Korea, that's what they call it, right? When the pupils are not equal, when the pupils are not equal, hmm, you suspect that there is something causing maybe a space occupying lesion somewhere on the brain. Whenever you see that the pupils are not equal, that's one of the things I will look out for when you're examining a patient for central nervous system. You know, central CNS examination, you start from uh, what now? Start from level of consciousness. You say conscious or unconscious. If the patient is unconscious, you talk about the uh, uh, GCS, all right, classical coma scale. Okay, you grade it and state exactly, and they've already graded it for you. They told you six. Okay, then you go ahead to look at the neck. Is the neck supple? All right, is it stiff? Let me not even get into examination, but let me still let me still talk about it. So, is the neck supple? Is the neck stiff? All those things that things that matter when you're doing your uh, because each of them will suggest something. Let's say the neck is stiff, maybe we may indict it. SAH can also cause neck stiffness, right? Even uh, 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 cervical, spinal injuries or whatever can cause neck stiffness. Okay, so the next thing you are going for is the cranial nerves. All right. So within the cranial nerves, you are going to look in the eyes, the pupils. Are they equal? Are they round? Are they central? Are they reactive to light? Direct and consensual light reflexes. These are what you are looking out for, all right? When you are doing CNX, and before you now start going to the tone, power reflexes, all those ones, sensation, gait, that's if patient is unconscious, for you start talking about gait, all right? But with these ones, you have an idea of what's something that may be going on, okay? So usually, we know that in um, in elderly patients, they tend to have more of um, subdural hematoma, okay? But uh, usually, extradural hematoma is, is is very rare in um, elderly patients. Okay, is rare in elderly patients generally, right? But when you consider the options and the things that are going on. You would think about other things, okay? So let's see, okay? So the key is subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, all right? Subdural hematoma is very rare in elderly, and they are occurs and they are occurs a lucid interval. Features are not consistent with meningitis. Opioid and pontan hemorrhage causes meiosis, right? Cause so cause um, pinpoint pupils. So likely diagnosis here is arachnoid hemorrhage. Anyway, based on the options available, okay, you guys are in, on, on, on track, right? But if let's say there was subdural hematoma here, that should be your answer. Okay, that should be your best option, considering the age, right, and evidence of um raise intracranial pressure or evidence of uh what do you call it a space occupying lesion okay you know that subarachnoid hemorrhage also is, is is a kind of space occupying lesion but it tends to spread out except if there is an obstruction because subarachnoid hemorrhage as well can cause obstruction within the ventricles so if it causes an obstruction on one side then you now start having that symptom, localizing it to one side, okay? But ideally, the ones that should localize you should be uh, epidural hematoma, also known as extradural hematoma, and subdural hematoma, right? They give you the localizing signs, okay? But SAH can also give you a focalizing sign, especially when there is an obstruction of the ventricles on that side, right? So we move. The next question is about a 69 year old woman. All right, let me paste the question in the, in the chat. 69 year old woman who presents with a sudden onset of weakness of her right arm and leg is known to be hypertensive. All right, there has been no 
headache, loss of consciousness, visual, speech or sensory symptoms, pulse is 100 beats per minute, and regular heart sounds, no carotid breath. There's higher mental function tests, are normal. No apraxia or neglect. Speech, swallowing, and sensation are normal. There are no visual field defects. There's a mild facial weakness, sparing the forehead. The right arm and um, the leg are flaccid and weak. Reflexes and tone are normal. There's a right extensor plantar response. What is the most likely cause of the patient's symptoms? This one is very long, but you have to take the time to work. Have you seen the questions? Or you are still reading it? You think is a lacuna stroke? Doctor Doctor Stara and um, the rest. Any ideas? <laughs> so no idea you had, Abby. All right. So let's let's go over the question again. A old woman that presents with a sudden onset of weakness of her right arm and leg because there's a stroke, right? Sudden onset weakness, right arm and, and, and leg. She's known to be hypertensive. Okay, a risk factor. There has been no headache, loss of consciousness, visual, speech, or sensory problems. Okay, in the examination we saw a BP of 180 over 90, pulse is 100, all right, and regular heartbeats, no carotid bruise, all right, all these ones are telling you that there is no suggestion of ischemic, so higher mental functions, tests are normal, no apraxia or neglect, speech, swallowing and seizure are normal, it's just the leg weakness, 
there are no visual field defense. There is a mild facial weakness, so it's special mild facial weakness and leg uh, weakness. Right, sudden onset, right sided uh, uh, weakness. All right. So, but they said the right arm and leg are flaccid. That's where the issue now starts. The right arm and leg are flaccid and weak. And when you use that word flaccid palsy, suggests something. Okay, so this is a, it's a it's an acute flaccid paralysis, paralysis. It's different from spastic paralysis, right? Okay, let's continue. Reflexes and tone are normal. Can you see? Tone and reflexes are normal. There is a right extensor plantar response. Extensor plantar response. So what's the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? Okay. Now, when you see an extensor plantar response, what does it suggest? It suggests an upper motor neuron lesion. Now, during, during the acute phase of a stroke, you, will, you have an initial um, flaccidity, okay, before spasticity. So, stroke starts with, even though it's an, a stroke is an upper motor neuron lesion, all right, but it starts with flaccidity before eventually it now becomes a. Uh, uh, spastic right later so the factors they have here cardioembolic stroke they've ruled it out because they told you there's no uh what, what did they even say that was normal all right no carotid blue nothing all right and there's regular heart sounds that one ruled out the cardioembolic stroke lacuna stroke lacuna stroke is an infarct all right and they were telling you there's no carotid blue so that's telling you that there's no there's no carotid brew. It's telling you there's no infarct. All right, because um, one of the risk factors for an infarct is where you have you know something suggesting that there is a carotid stenosis, carotid atherosclerosis, from where the embolus and the other things can be thrown into the CNS. All right, so higher met um. Right internal carotid artery, atheroembolic stroke. Okay, that's a differential. That's a strong differential. But they are telling you that there is no carotid brew. So that also rules out that one. Then they also mention a right internal carotid artery dissection. Okay, possible. It can be right, but I don't know. Um, was ruling it out now. Then he also mentioned a right vertebral artery, ather atheroembolic stroke. Okay, so there are just so, so many things. I think it's between option D and option E. Just a thought. But uh, lacunas, in fact, an in fact. So it's, yes, it's basically a rule out ruling. And so medicine bill, if you want to. You have to rule out and rule in. You have to analyze all the options. You rule out, rule in. But uh, we are looking anyway. So. For the right internal carotid artery dissection, that one, I've never even seen that diagnosis before. Internal carotid artery dissection, right? Then right vertebral artery, atheroembolic stroke. The problem is that all of them are still atheroembolic. All the options are atheroembolic. Uh, in fact, right? But in the absence of carotid glue, you should know that. It's not anything that has to do with carotid artery. So if, if it was, at least there will be a brew that will localize it to those regions. So in the absence of that, we should think of something else that may be ongoing. So um, high blood pressure. I'm looking out for what could suggest a carotid, a lacuna, in fact. Okay. 
sudden onset of weakness on the, on her right arm and leg. Okay. Then um, she's hypertensive. Okay. Okay. Most most cases of um, lacuna infarcts actually are linked to hypertension, systemic hypertension. All right. So um, I think they say that hypertension is the commonest cause of lacuna infarct. So when you see a patient that is hypertensive, you should look at the lacuna first. And where is the lacuna, self? Lacuna, like, uh, lacuna, in fact, is like tiny, small vessels, tiny, very tiny, small uh, blood vessels. So even in the absence of an obvious carotid, whatever, uh, obvious embolism, okay? She is in the basal ganglia. Uh, we'll, we'll check it out. Right. So even in the absence of an obvious uh, embolism, okay? And still have a lacuna in fact because they are very very tiny they are easy to be obstructed all right so i think you guys are correct the lacuna um in fact and the answer here it is lacuna in fact okay so the key lacuna in fact weakness of the right arm and leg so lesion is on the left side all right um also, no atrial fibrillation or carotid artery disease, and features are very much consistent with no infarct. Okay. 23 year old man is having difficulty in speaking following a stab wound to the neck. Let me paste it. Okay, no, Dr. Naya, you are saying it must not be, it must not be embolic, Abi. Okay, they say lacuna stroke, not lacuna in fact. All right, you are right. Can be ischemic or hemorrhagic. All right, here, old man. Who is having difficulty in speaking following a stab wound to the right of the tip deviated to the right? Which anatomical site is most likely to be affected? Facial nerve, hypoglossal nerve, vagus nerve, trigeminal nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve. Moving stuff. More answers, please. Okay, so um, you're right. It's a hypoglossal nerve. Of course, from the question, this one is very simple. When you have a hypoglossal nerve um, injury, you have a deviation to that same side. You have division of the tongue to the same to the side of the affected lesion. All right, and you know that the hypoglossal nerve is the nerve that supplies. When you hear anything, anytime you hear glossary, glosso, you know it has to do with the tongue, right? And so glossary. He's talking about like, so hypoglossal nerve supplies the muscles of the tongue. Okay, so 
and it passes through what what, what nerve is it cranial nerve what okay yes so it's cranial nerve 12 so it passes through like the neck before it gets down the I think there's a way it, it, it comes back again to the tongue to supply the, the tongue. So when there's an injury in the neck, you can have an injury to the hypoglossal nerve. So in hypoglossal nerve parts, the tongue will be curved towards the damaged side, combined with the presence of fasciculations, yes, fasciculations and atrophy. They're suggestive of um, hypoglossal nerve injury. The next question is about a 43-year-old man of a three-year-old who presented with vertigo, vertigo on um, moving sideways while sleeping. What test would you do to confirm this diagnosis? We talked about this. <laughs> we talked about this yesterday. Those who were in class yesterday will remember. The options include Hall Pikes maneuver. Rumbeck test, then the Lemberg test, heel chain test. Because this is an MCQ, the more you're, you're exposed to things, the more you know you get knowledge. You never know that you know it until maybe when you see the question. So it's whole packed maneuver. Though we don't know how it works, we don't know exactly what, what it does, but we just know it's whole packed maneuver. And uh, there's another one too, there's another maneuver that was named after somebody too. Right, in which uh, you're supposed to try to shift the head. Okay, what's the diagnosis first? Uh, there are plenty of maneuvers. I'm going to try to position the head somehow because what causes this diagnosis that we have here is a uh, is BPV. Yes, is BPV. The nine positional uh, vertigo. All right, it is the commonest cause of vertigo. All right, so the person the vertigo that occurs when the person moves the head with position, changes in position of the head. That's why it's called positional, all right, the tigo. So it's benign, it's not malignant, and it's actually non-distressing. But because the person can have a fall when that vertigo occurs. <laughs> so when the person moves the head, it has to have issues. So there are some, they say that the pathogenesis of it is cal uh, like calcium crystals is lodged in a part of the, you know, you know, the vestibule cochlear nerve supplies the vestibule and the cochlea. So lodged around that region where we know has to do with um, uh, maintenance of balance and posture. Okay, so that's what happens. So with that maneuver, you actually try to move that calcium crystal away from that part of the of the ear to somewhere else where it may not cause uh, a tigo. So we are in order, these whole bikes. Of course, heel shin, heel shin is for cerebral lesions. Heel shin test is for cerebral lesions. Trend the Lundberg test, what's Trend the Lundberg test again? Rumbeck's test, what's Rumbeck's test? Rumbeck's sign. Rumbeck's sign, I think, differentiates um, cerebellar ataxia from uh, which other attacks you are now? Yes, posterior column. Yeah, Rumbeck sign differentiates uh, cerebellar attack there from posterior column. Those are column media meniscus attacks there, right? It's like, like I think how you do it, you you tell the you tell the patient to stand the eyes and close the eyes. Okay, if uh, the patient falls while uh, the eyes are closed, you know some patients some patients may may still be uh, may fall when the eyes are closed, but when the eyes are open, they will still be able to maintain their posture. I think that's the one that is uh, cerebellar. And when it is dosal column, there's no help. Whether the person, whether the eyes are closed or the eyes are open, then we we'll always um, 
feel like falling. So when you are doing that test, you have to stand behind the patient, be ready to catch the patient because the patient may, may fall during the process. 73 year old woman with skeletal and breast metastasis. So the next question is about a 73-year-old woman with skeletal and brain metastasis from breast cancer. She, um, she has weakness of her legs, minimal knee and absent ankle tendon reflexes, a palpable bladder, a power of two over five at the hip, three over five at the knee and ankle tenderness over the second lumbar vertebrae. There is reduced sensation in the perineum she has been started on the exam to see milligram daily. What's the single most likely cause of her weakness? Paraneoplastic neuropathy, progression of brain tumor, PID at L2, L3, spinal cord compression, steroid induced myopathy. The total thinks is paraneoplastic. Good thing, Dr. Noya. So she thinks it's spinal cord compression. Okay. So the answer is spinal cord compression. I wonder too. I wonder what PID is because PID I know is pelvic inflammatory disease. I don't think that's what they are referring to. All right. So, um, they said um, the likely correct option is spinal cord compression. Brain metastasis induced cerebral edema can explain blurring of vision, secondary to raise intracranial pressure. But, like, that, that brain metastasis, all right, the answer is correct on its own. But because what they asked is the most likely cause of her weakness, and they told you initially that there was both skeletal and brain metastasis from the breast CA. So the one that is causing the weakness of the lower limb, which is a lower motor neuron lesion, is spinal cord compression, right? You know, when, when the tumor is prolapsed in the vertebral disc, Okay, so you turn you turn this upside down. It's, it's no more in the uh, disc prolapse. Now prolapse in the vertebral disc. Okay, that may that may be that may be what it means in this context. Yeah, You're correct, likely correct. So um, spinal cord compression because as the tumor is growing, there will be an increase. And they will now begin. Uh, there will now be pressure symptoms right around the site where it is localized. So, next question.
Next question is about a 30 year old lady complaining of rights ear deafness. Right ear deafness with decreased cornea reflex and past pointing. Acoustic analysis shows SNHL. What's the most appropriate investigation to do? 30 year old complaining of right ear deafness. You know what's SN, SNHL? It should be sensory neural hearing loss. Okay? Sensory neural hearing loss. 30 year old lady complaining of right ear deafness with decreased corneal reflex and past pointing. Caustic analysis shows sensory neural hearing loss. What's the next most appropriate investigation to do? Next most appropriate. We've already done a. So the, the problems here are right ear deafness, is decreased cornea reflex, deafness and cornea reflex, then past pointing. Okay, then acoustic analysis, which are shown in sensory, sensory neural, which means it's, it's nervous. Okay, what is the next most uh, appropriate investigation to do? There's CT scan, CT brain scan, a CT acoustic canal. There's MRI brain, there's MRI acoustic canal, there's PET scan. Okay, Dr. Suchi thinks it's MRI brain. So Chara takes his MRI acoustic canal. Not to know you any ideas. Bishop, we're not seeing your, your contribution today. What's happening? Is this CNS Wahala? Because this CNS conk. Before we finish, um, we'll take some days and actually go through the theories that will have strong theoretical backings for everything we are doing, right? So the answer is um, MRI acoustic canal. So let's look it up. First of all, trend the Lemberg positive test usually indicates weakness in the hip abductor muscles. That's gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. This um, trend the Lemberg sign is found in people with weak or paralyzed uh, abductor muscles of the hip, namely gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. All right. But meanwhile, trend the Lemberg position is. The body is laid supine or flat on the back on a 15 to 30 degree incline with the feet elevated above the head. That one is trying to remember position. I know they do that for the number test, which is used to turn the number sign. I know we've passed the question, but I'm still mentioning it because I asked. Back then, you guys didn't give me any response. All right. So, what are we looking for? MRI acoustic canal. Oh. MRI of the inter internal auditory canal is firmly established as an essential modality in the imaging of the temporal bone and lateral skull base. It is used to currently the study of choice for assessment of the internal auditory canal, right?
sensory neural hearing, hearing loss is SNHL. The internal acoustic canal, also known as internal auditory canal or meatus, is um, a bony canal within the petrol portion of the temporal bone that transmits nerves and vessels from within the posterior canal to the auditory and vestibular apparatus. So I think this, this is where the answer is because it transmits nerves, all right, and blood vessels. So, and the, the issue that the patient is having suggests that the patient has a nervous issue, okay? With like, you know, vestibular cochlear nerve is the nerve that supplies the, the inner ear, all right? Both the vestibular part of it and the cochlear part of it. Cochlear is for hearing, vestibular is for maintenance of balance, okay? So the that um, the nerve will pass through this internal acoustic canal, internal auditory meatus, all right? Which, so if, if there's something that is obstructing it there, it will cause that nervous issue, all right? So doing an MRI that will show you that canal will help you to localize where the problem is. Just doing a general brain MRI may not be of much help because when you are localizing, and we know that MRI will show you soft, soft tissues, all right, better than CT scan. So it is not a CT acoustic canal. All right, so a seven two year old male presents with acute confusion. He has been in Decrease corneal reflex, pass pointing. Okay, pass pointing that is suggesting a cerebral lesion, have you? But we have to be sure that um, vestibular disease does not cause pass pointing. So you may just be surprised that it does. Yeah, the things where they, where they book it could shock you. Yeah, it could shock you. Sometimes they shock me, self. You will see them, it will shock you. Something that you didn't know before. So you may not be surprised. Remember that vestibular, um, vestibular part is also involved with the um, maintenance of balance, which is mostly what cerebellum does, right? So don't be surprised that it's, it's powerful. I understand. And you know, corneal reflex is not necessarily, it's not, Cornea, what, 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 which nerve carries the corneal reflex? Please, can every other person hear me? Let me know if it's only Agatha that cannot hear me. Dr. Agatha, they can hear me. Others can hear me. Check your volume. She's gone. Your volume, your network, right? It has to be one of those two. Or your ears. <laughs> Sorry. So um, what are we looking for again, Seth? We are looking for I'm going to the next question. Next question is about a 72 year old male who presents with acute confusion. With acute confusion, um, he has been in the hospital two weeks. Let me check my own end now. Yeah. 
I want to believe you can hear me now, Dr. Noya. Can you hear me now? All right. So you can see the question in the in the in the chat space. All right. A 72 year old male who presents with acute confusion. He has been he has been in the hospital for two weeks, having been treated for a deep, deep venous thrombosis. Okay. He was treated for DVT. Okay. The nurses have noticed that he became increasingly drowsy. On examination, there are small scalp laceration, a GCS of eight, and bilateral upgoing plantar response. Upgoing, that's extensor plantar response, right? What's the most likely diagnosis? The options include infection toxicity, delirium tremens, extradural hematoma, subdural hematoma, electrolyte imbalance. Okay. So you chose subdural hematoma. The age and the gradual onset of the progression is very suggestive. Though they didn't give us a history of fall, but uh, he said he's, he noticed to be to become increasingly drowsy. Then the, the, the scalp laceration as well. Small scalp laceration, right? Which which implies that the patient had a fall. Right. Yeah, you're very correct, Dr. Shara. So even trivial head trauma can lead to subdural hematoma. Remember when we looked at the theoreticals behind subdural hematoma, we found out that a patient may even have, have had a fall some time ago. And there's the acute, there's the subacute, there's the chronic. Okay? So a patient may have had a fall some, some time ago and may have even Forgotten that I had a fall. So you, you, you may get a negative history, but there is a fall. Presence of small scalp laceration, confusion, and becoming increasingly drowsy, glasocoma scale of eight, aggressive or subdural hematoma. And the DVT treatment. I wonder too. Is, is a they they are using that one for throwing you off. So you have seen questions where they will just throw you off. You will now be confused. <laughs> uh, you cannot explain it, Bishop, because if you start trying to link the DVT, this thing is it's not it's not everything you can explain. If you try trying to link the DVD, I mean, you should be thinking of something hemorrhagic. Okay, well, yeah, you may have a, you may have a point. Yeah, you may have a point. Because they also mentioned, I think one of the risk factors, apart from age, trauma, there's a alcohol, yes, and there is a, this anticoagulant use, okay? So, patient that was managed for DVT, you are right. All right, Dr. Bishop. Well done for that deep insight. Okay, so a seven year old female presents with balance problems. On examination, there's an nystagmus of the left lateral gaze. So let me pose the question for you guys. This is a seven-year-old female who presents with balance problems. On examination, there's nystagmus of the left lateral gaze, a loss of the corneal reflex, and reduced hearing in the left ear. What is the most likely di diagnosis? 
venereal disease, acoustic neuroma, cerebral abscess, pituitary tumor, gentle medicine. Seven, she is female, presents with balance problems. Okay, then nystagmus on the lateral left, lateral left gaze, a loss of the left cornea. So this issue is on the left, hearing loss, left cornea reflex, left lateral gaze. Okay. So Dr. Bishop thinks is Meniere's disease. Mm. Minera is not a benign condition. You, okay, okay, because we say you should, you should not explain everything. You throw away the left lateral gaze. <clears throat> okay, okay, you captured the, the. What did you capture again? You captured nystagmus. Does Minera disease cause nystagmus? You captured the. You didn't capture left corneal reflex. Of course, it causes left hearing defect. All right, it can cause hearing defect. It can cause uh, 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 vertigo. Yes, it's a common cause of vertigo. Okay. But uh, there are so many other things that we cannot explain. Okay. Let us. Uh, Let's look at acoustic neuroma because that's the answer. We have to consider the age. There's a very short note on acoustic neuroma. Dr. Agatha, I hope you can hear me now. Hello. Every village person that is against your destiny, I bound that past. An acoustic neuroma is a benign tumor that develops on the nerve that connects the ear to the brain. The tumor usually grows slowly. As it grows, it presses against the hearing and balance nerves. At first, you may have no symptoms or mild symptoms. Symptoms may include loss of hearing on one side ringing in ears or dizziness and balance problems the tumor can also eventually cause numbness or paralysis of the face if it grows large enough it can press against the brain becoming life-threatening acoustic neuroma can be difficult to diagnose because the symptoms are similar to those of middle ear problems Ear exams, hearing tests, and scans can show if you have it. If the tumor stays small, you may only need to have it checked regularly. If you do need treatment, surgery and radiation are options. If the tumors affect both hearing nerves, it is often because of a genetic disorder called neurofibromatosis. Okay, acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma. So I, I think one thing that was suggestive of acoustic neuroma was the unilateral uh, symptoms. What do you think, Dr. Bishop? Sometimes you'll hear these tumors. Meniere's disease won't be generalized. 
Sometimes you'll hear these tumors referred to as acoustic neuromas, and that's actually not very accurate. The true name of these is a vestibular schwannoma. These are tumors that grow off of the, the insulating cells off the actual balance nerve. So acoustic neuromas are benign tumors that grow on the hearing and balance nerve, what's known as the eighth cranial nerve. They actually grow off the balance portion of the nerve almost every time. They're the most common tumor in the area of the brain that we call the posterior fossa. So they're tumors that are still uncommon, perhaps one in 100,000 people have them, but they're the most common of an uncommon tumor. Often there's very, very little that you can tell about these tumors when they're there. The most common thing is actually hearing loss, and usually that's in a single ear. So in most people, as they lose hearing, whether it's from noise or age, both ears tend to lose hearing at a similar rate. In acoustic neuromas, one ear will become dramatically different. Now sometimes it's as subtle as just noticing ringing in the ear or tinnitus in one ear, but that's a sign that you need to actually evaluate that ear and be sure there's nothing else going on deeper inside. Depending on the size of the tumor, where the tumor is, the age of the patient, and how much hearing they have left, there's actually three different ways that we can approach the tumors. Beginning posteriorly or be well behind the ear, there's a sort of a traditional craniotomy we call a retrosigmoid craniotomy and that will get you access to most of the tumors. Another method in patients that have already lost their hearing or for whom the tumor is so large that preserving the hearing is unlikely, we can actually go through the ear via an operation we call a translabyrinthine operation. That's sort of a, a large version of an, of an ear surgery that takes you right down to the tumor. The final way that we approach these tumors is via what's called a middle fossa craniotomy, and that's for smaller tumors that are just in the tiny canal where the nerves come through. So those are three different options that an experienced team will have available to them. It's really important that you get in with a team that's actively taking care of these tumors so you can see what the best options are for you. These tumors should be very individualized, so it's important that So I'm looking at um, Meniere's disease, all right? Symptoms are not localized, all right? Symptoms include vertigo, ringing in the ears, hearing loss, and the fullness of the ears, all right? But Typically, only one ear is affected initially. However, over time, both ears will become involved, okay? So generally, each episode lasts about 20 minutes to a few hours. Then um, the time between episodes varies. The hearing loss and ringing in the ears can become constant over time. There's, that means there's a prominence of this um, tinnitus, all right? The cause is unclear. There's genetic and environmental associations. Symptoms are believed to occur as a result of increased fluid buildup in the labyrinth of the inner ear. So diagnosis is based on symptoms and frequently a hearing test. All right. Cure does not exist. Tags are often treated with medications to help with the nausea and anxiety. So it all this uh, the Tygo, uh ringing sensation in the ears and uh, hearing loss, okay? Which starts as unilateral but becomes generalized. So let's look at the age incident. It most often starts in people 40 to 60 years old. Females are more commonly affected than males, all right? That's Meniere's disease, okay? 40 to 60. And our patient was 67 and had unilateral symptoms, okay? So now let's, let's look at the cornea, cornea reflect and which nerve is uh, involved in cornea reflex.
So the corneal glenk reflex is caused by a loop between the trigeminal sensory nerves and the facial motor nerve innervation of the orbicularis oculi. All right. The reflex, you, you, you know that it's actually, uh, that corneal reflex is a sensation. It's, it's not motor. So it is not facial nerve. It is, the nerve is coming from trigeminal nerve, but joins facial nerve. I don't know if you, if you get the picture, right? The nerve is coming from the trigeminal nerve, but follows the facial nerve as, it's, as it is going, all right? So, um, innovation, the reflex activates when a sensory stimulus contacts either free nerve endings or mechanical receptors within the epithelium of the cornea. So you may just be surprised that all these nerves, like nerve five, that's trigeminal nerve, and nerve eight may have a path where they cross somewhere. Anatomy. Let's see now. Let's see. Something has to give. They've mentioned this corneal reflex on two different occasions that involve the, the ear. All right. So there's a there's a link somewhere. All right. The nucleus is in the pons. Uh, let's let's look at where the nucleus of vestibular is. Okay, vestibular nerve, they are both grouped in the pons and the medulla in the brainstem. Vestibular nerve, nuclei, are the cranial nuclei for vestibular nerve? Where are they found? They have different nuclei for the vestibular, they have a different nuclei for the, yes. Acoustic neuroma, yes. Lower pons, upper medulla. So, okay, I understand what you're saying that you're trying to say it's not from the nucleus. But I just want to know, I just want to know where the, the nuclei are. Let me see. There's this thing about classification of cranial nerves into the nuclei. Into the location of the nuclei. So I'm not coming from the pond, I'm not coming from the medulla. I used to have a code for it. Let me see, let me remind myself. So the, the reflex is mediated by the nasociliary branch of the ophthalmic branch, V1 of trigeminal nerve, sensing the stimulus in the cornea. Only that's afferent. The afferent fibers are from the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, all right? Then the temporal and zygomatic branches of the facial nerve initiating the motor response, okay? And the central nucleus is located in the pons of the brainstem. So, I, you know, the facial nerve passes through the ear. Uh, I think that's that's our link. The facial nerve. You know, the facial nerve passes through the ear, right? There's a point when it passes through the, the, the middle ear or the inner ear. Let me look at. Let's look at the course. 
Yes, they are boosting the pumps. It emerges facial nerve uh, course. It emerges from the pons of the brainstem, controls muscles of facial nerve. Of course, we know that and taste and tongue and all those things. So it typically travels from the pons through the facial canal, the temporal bone. That same temporal bone. We're talking about that same temporal bone where we know the the other canal is internal auditory meatus is all right and exists the score at the stylomastoid foramen. It arises from the brainstem. All right. So is that temporal bone, is, is that place, that inner ear course, that's where the issue is, that's where something must have happened, okay? So part of the facial nerve is divided into six segments, intracranial, cisternal segment, neatal segment within the internal audit, uh, I, I, I don't catch them. The meatal <laughs> Within the internal canal. So if you passes through the internal or through the in two parts, always saying, are we happy? Meatus, internal auditory meatus. Seems we are going to stop at 26 percent today. This patient is about a 63 year old man who presents after having had a seizure. An examination, patient is alert and oriented. Then um, there's inattention on the left side and hyperreflexia of the arm. What's the most probable diagnosis? Let's go over it again. Six year old male presents after having had a seizure. Okay. He had a seizure. He's alert and oriented. All right. For examination, there's inattention on the left side and hyperreflexia of the arm. Probably on that same left side. What's the most probable diagnosis? Cerebral tumor, pituitary adenoma, cerebellar abscess, Huntington's chorea, Parkinsonism. What do you think? Yeah, considering the age and all these uh, features. You know, there's a localizing sign to one side, to the left side, hyperreflexia, the left side, and inattention. Okay. Yes, so we are correct. That's the answer. Cerebral tumor, like among the, as we they even say cerebral abscess, yeah, it would have given us, let's say they told us there was fever or something, and then they said cerebral abscess, but they said cerebella. Uh, cerebellum, okay, so that was uh, not part of our deal. So the next question is about a 68-year-old man who awoke to find that he is unable to close his left eye and he's drooling saliva hmm? from the left angle of his mouth. What a single most appropriate option? Uh, this one, this one I give away now. The exam you want to be having more questions here is where the corneal nerve and the facial nerve are crossing back. Of course, it is the facial nerve. So the patient is drilling saliva. If you know the signs of the facial nerve from 
you know, they say this in upper spares, spares upper. So there's this inability to look like when they want, they are looking up, but the facial creases, the creases on the forehead will not just be flat, to not move, all right, on the affected side. Then the, the, the eyes, what's that thing called again? Okay, there's a sign that's named after it, right? Where I think, you know, part of the examination, you ask the patient to close the, the eyes, all right? Close it tight as much as they can so that you cannot open it. But when you find out is that you can easily open the eyes, right? So when they are sleeping, the eyes does not close on that affected side. All right. So you now be seeing the whites, the eyes, or you tell the patient to close the eyes, then you are seeing the whites. The sign is named after it. Okay. Then there's a you know the facial nerve is also involved. Gives a branch to cut that tympani, I mean, cut that tympani nerve that uh, uh, also supplies the tongue. The lingual nerve supplies the tongue, all right? The anterior to third, the tongue. So you have taste sensation. Those are some of the things that you check too. And uh, okay, the branch it gives to cut that tympani is the one that is involved with uh, the causes tinnitus, hyperacusis. Thank you, hyperacusis on the affected side, okay? That's part of what you check when you are testing for the channel. Then the one you tell the patient to blow the whistle as if, or try to blow a trumpet or to off their, their, their mouth without a, then when you press, you find out that one side is weak, okay? You cannot blow a trumpet, you cannot blow a whistle, so anything that involves blowing. All right, so it's the facial nerve. And the saliva will be drooling, from the side, I've seen before. Right. Let's go to the next one. Complaints of tremors every time he tends to use his uh, muscles when he is pointing at objects. So that's that's an intention tremor. No complaints at rest. Father complained of similar problems. What's the most probable diagnosis? Parkinsonism, lithium toxicity, thyrotoxicosis, benign essential tremor. It is not tremors at, re at rest, it is tremor comes. When he wants to do something, tremor comes. And his father complained of similar co problems too. What's the most probable diagnosis? Yes, it is benign essential tremor. Okay, let's look at the options one by one. Parkinsonism causes, um, uh, tremors at rest, right? Parkinsonism causes tremors at rest. Lithium toxicity mm, may cause tremors, but not due to, not the one that you have positive family history, all right? Because there's positive family history. That's what especially suggests benign essential tremor. So benign essential tremor is a kind of tremor that will cause, there may be intention tremor, all right? So, they said um, alcohol can help reduce the symptoms, right? Where, whereas hyperadrenergic uh, discharge, anxiety, and all those things can stress can worsen the symptoms, right? So if, if you've met people, you know that there are some persons who generally they have, they're always having tremors. Like I have a house officer 
who <laughs> just a young guy, but he he has tremor. Like when he wants to go something, he's having that tremor. He's writing, he's having tremor. He's uh, but when he's just at rest, no issue. Okay, so that's called intention tremor. And he's also found in cerebellar lesions. As I mean, the cerebellar lesion in this question. And there was no, no nothing about his uh, uh, family who had a stroke. Now there is left sided weakness and right side facial numbness. Okay. This shows ischemic stroke. What, which one would you prescribe? Alteplase, aspirin, clopidogrel, heparin, warfarin. So, fully, would you prescribe? What's the gold standard? What do they use? They didn't give they didn't talk about previous history of stroke. They just said she had a stroke. Just prescribe anyone. All the drugs there can almost be given self. But I think they're just looking for the best, best option. So like they're implying that this patient just had a stroke now, right? And CT has confirmed that it's an ischemic stroke. And we know that if it's within uh, how many hours again? Two hours. You can use uh, fibrinolytics. Can you hear me? If it's within, okay. So the explanation given here is, is implying that CT detects. Some say CT detects ischemic stroke beyond window period, right? Which is beyond 48 hours, which is not correct. And it is able to, it's not like it cannot detect stroke within less than 48 hours, but it's just that um, it is more likely that an MRI would detect in an ischemic CBA within 48 hours than that a CT can would detect it, right? So that's really that. But if a CT scan has already shown you that it is an ischemic stroke, then you can go for a place, right? So we we'll move. This will be the last question for today. Okay, well, we are close to 30, we are 29%. Let's, let's get to 30. I will not turn them per day. Alte place is the answer. The 
patient came to the emergency department after he had banged his car quite a few times on reversing. He was complaining of seeing double while he tried to look back during the process of reversing the car. He also complains of double vision on looking at an outward gaze, which nerve is involved after he had banged his car quite a few times on reversing. He was complaining of seeing double while he tried to look back <laughs> during the process of reversing. And he also complains of double vision on looking at an up outward gaze. It's absent, trochlear, or plomoto. These two are totally out of it. So there's this um, A3, laryngeal sulfate A3, all right? So LR6, SO4, A3. So uh, um, plomoto supplies all as A3. Then um, superior oblique supplied by trochlear nerve. Then lateral leg rectus supplied by ab abducens. Absent nerve, right? So this patient cannot look uh, outward. That's the that's the domain of the lateral rectus, and that's the place that is supplied by the absent nerve. Okay, so the lateral rectus palsy. And you know when when you try to look at the place part that is affected by the lesion, there will be a diplopia. Right, it's double vision. So when he tries to look back during the process of reversing the car, lateral, they're going to be looking laterally, right? So that causes double vision. Then also when he tries to look outwards, look sideways, okay? You have double vision, that's absent. Do you guys understand the code I gave? Arrange yourself it, that's what I call it. LR6, O4, A3. A common code. I think we learned that one in medical school. Yeah, the next question is about a 24 year old man. Who had a head injury? The next question is about a 24 year old man after a head injury who presents with difficulty in dressing himself, difficulty in writing, and inability to differentiate the fingers of his hands. Which part of the brain is most likely affected? Had a head injury. Can no longer dress himself. This is like apraxia. Difficulty in writing. Uh, what do they call difficulty in writing? Dysatria. Have we? No, it's not dysatria. Difficulty in writing. And then inability to differentiate the fingers of his hands. Which part of the brain is most likely affected? Occipital, parietal, temporal, frontal, brainstem. Frontal lobe, respiratory lobe, dressing apraxia, and then agraphia. You know, this is right, it's called agraphia. And then finger agnosia. Maybe aphasia, did they talk about aphasia? They, they did not mention, they make any mention of aphasia. You know about difficulty with dressing, difficulty with writing, and inability you know, to differentiate the fingers of his hands. So, dressing apraxia, agraphia, and finger agnosia, and features of parietal lobe lesions. Damage to the left parietal lobe can result in what is called adjustment syndrome. It, it includes right to left confusion, difficulty with writing, agraphia, difficulty with math mathematics, acalculia, 
may also produce disorder of language, aphasia, and inability to perceive objects, normally agnosia. So it is obviously parental love. The diagnosis, blah, blah, blah. I think frontal lobe is more of um, all these um, memory loss, personality changes, disinhibition, social disinhibition, right? Behavioral changes, aggressive behavior. That's frontal lobe. It has to do with personality. But um, parental lobe, and now does with all these uh, fine movements, okay? agraphia, acalculia. Doesn't can no more calculate mathematics. Maybe he was very good with mathematics before. And um, agraphia, and no rights, difficulty with writing. Uh, can still have some aphasia, but that's not the primary, all right? And agnosia, like he can no longer recognize objects that he, he could recognize before. He can't even recognize his own hands. That's, that's terrible. <laughs> Your own uh, benign essential acalculia. So um, the next question is about the last question for today. We are now in 30%. What do you mean by more of receptive? Okay. So receptive aphasia is for temporal loop. We're talking about parietal loop. That's where all this acalculia, agraphia, acalculia, agnosia, all these things are coming in. Agraphia, inability to write. Calculator cannot calculate mathematics. Agnosia cannot recognize objects, common objects. Okay, the next question is about a 24 year old woman who presents with tingling and twitching of her fingers, followed by a throbbing unilateral headache. What's the most likely the diagnosis? Tingling and twitching of her fingers, followed by throbbing unilateral headache. This is the clincher, throbbing unilateral headache. In fact, the code. I use for migraine is uh, sultan. Maybe they use sultans, tomatriptan, and all those things for treating my uh, migraine, migraine headache. Okay, so sultans means severe unilateral throbbing headache associated with nausea, vomiting, uh, photophobia, phonophobia, right, and other sensory symptoms. That's the meaning of sultans. As my code. So, um, migraine. And that's, that's, that twitching that she has, it's called an aura. Yes, that A cannot, that A can also sound, it, uh, I mean, stand for aura, right? So, aura is feeling of, I just explained sort of severe, S is severe, U is unilateral, as a UL, unilateral throbbing headache, associated with aura, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, all right, and other sensory symptoms. As a mean of sultans. Okay. So what was I even explaining? Yeah, aura, aura is a feeling that something is about to happen. It's kind of like a feeling of impending doom, that aura, okay? So some people, before they have a CVA, they may have an aura. Some people, before they have a, a seizure, maybe in a, a, a epileptics, like someone who has an epileptic form disorder, all right? Some of them do have auras, like maybe it's maybe sensory aura, it's maybe motor aura. That twitching is a motor aura. Sensory aura, maybe maybe vision, something will just maybe ha uh, a halo will just appear in the eyes or something else, right? That's aura. Okay. Maybe they just perceive a strange smell, some funny, funny sensitivities that they don't usually have before. That's an aura, right? So it can occur with migrainous headaches. And of course, this is a very young woman. It's also a clincher. It's a young woman. 
So migraines are more in females and it's more in younger females. One of the treatments for migraine is use of sultans, also known as summer tryptan, all those um, 5-HT5 receptor agonists. The profile law is used for uh, prophylaxis of migraine. But for treatment, you don't use profile law for treatment, you use it for prophylaxis. For treatment, you actually start with NSAIDs, okay? Then you can now progress. When it now becomes you can see that's when you include and summer treatments and so on and so forth. Okay. There's also a place for egot, egot alkaloids, in treatment of migraineous headaches. I think we may have to end on that note, but let me leave you with something. migraine I got a me I got alkaloids which other situation do you use I got What are uses of egg guts? Egg guts There's also a, a place for CBT, I think, cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, they use it for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. Yes, now. You've never used an ego, you've never used ego termin before. That's so many other uses. Like it causes uterine contraction. So it can prevent PPH. After the woman has delivered, of course. Just like oxytocin and the uh, What's the other one they insert? Misoprostol. Migraines are more than just headaches. They're pre-headaches, post-headaches, sensitivities, nausea, fatigue, and can even bring on food cravings. But most of all, they are painful and frustrating for those who suffer from them. For years, they were misunderstood, but now we know it comes down to two main things, your genes and your brain. To really understand why migraines are so much more than headaches, first we have to know what headaches are. My name is Rashmi Halker Singh. I am a fellowship trained, board certified headache neurologist here at Mayo Clinic. I'm also the headache fellowship program director here at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. There's actually a huge book called The International Classification of Headache Disorders, which has maybe 300 different diagnoses of different types of headache. So when we say headache, all we mean by that is pain above the neck. And yes, migraines are pains above the neck, so they are headaches. But again, suffering from a migraine attack is much more than just having a headache. So migraine is actually a problem of brain dysfunction. It's a genetic disorder that is very common. So by diagnostic criteria, you need to have recurrent headaches, whether they happen infrequently or frequently, lasting four to 72 hours without medication. And then in addition to that, the pain has to have at least two of the following four symptoms. The pain needs to be moderate or severe in intensity and more intense on one side of the head, throbs or pulses, and gets worse with activity. But to stay on theme, a migraine is more than just experiencing pain. You also have to have either a sensitivity to light or sound or nausea. In fact, migraine attacks come in four stages with a painful headache being just one of them. Before the headache stage, some people, about one-fourth of migraine sufferers, will experience what is called an aura. When someone has a visual aura, they will see light spots, jagged lines, things like that in their vision. 
sometimes people will have a sensory aura as well in which they'll have like a pins and needles tingling sensation up one limb. And again, this typically lasts five to 60 minutes and it's typically followed pretty much immediately by the headache. But before that, migraine sufferers will experience a prodrome, the first stage in the migraine attack. This stage can last an entire day and includes symptoms like increased yawning, trouble concentrating, increased urination, and even cravings for things like chocolate. Finally, after the headache phase has ended, a lot of my patients will tell me, you know, doc, I have this like headache hangover. And that's what we would call a migraine post -drome. This is not fully understood exactly just yet, but we think it's probably a recovery phase within the brain and they might feel just really tired or fatigued or still have trouble concentrating, just kind of still recovering from the whole episode. So when we think about migraine, those would be the four phases. Most of what we know has to do with the pain phase. And what we know is not a lot. It was once thought that migraines were caused by constriction and dilation of the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain. But we know that's not the case anymore. We know that migraine is actually a problem of brain dysfunction. It originates from the brain itself, and it's a problem of pain processing. And there's a whole host of different components involved in this whole pain processing abnormality. And because of that, there's lots of different genes involved as well. A few genes have been identified, but we're still learning more about this. So we know that genes are a part of migraines. You can be genetically predisposed to have these painful headaches. And researchers have identified the part of the brain involved with migraines and the lingering pain associated with them. Really a lot of our emphasis on migraine has to do with something called the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, which is um, you know, some, something in the brainstem that's really important for pain processing. And when a migraine attack occurs, there are what we call trigeminal afferents or nerve endings um, that also become activated and they will release CGRP. CGRP stands for calcitonin gene-related peptide and when released helps the pain continue, resulting in a long, drawn-out painful migraine headache. Now, how this exactly works is still unknown, but the correlation between CGRPs and migraine headaches has actually led to some better treatment options for patients. For the first time in history, we have preventive treatments designed to treat migraine based on what we know as to what happens in the, in the brain during a migraine attack. And um, a lot of research has shown us that if you, um, you know, infuse CGRP in a patient who's susceptible to having migraines, you can trigger a migraine attack. And if you block CGRP, that reduction in CGRP levels correlates with migraine improvement. So based on that information, if you block CGRP, that reduction in CGRP levels correlates with migraine improvement. So based on that information, we've been able to develop some new medications. All right, guys, with that, we'll call it a night, okay? It's been great having you all, and um, congratulations once more to all those who excelled in the recent um, exam, all right? I'm happy for you guys, and I'm happy to be part of your success. So we move. Good night, guys. More success. Future nights.